Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's episode. Tonight's episode is very interesting because I want to speak about the world as if it's a newborn baby. You know, as if the world is a newborn world. Is that the psychology of the child's mind first becomes the moment. That means your mind before being your sense of subjective self was being the world. So as your mind There is an objective uh, phenomena. This objective phenomena, in some sense, replicates itself subjectively as the world, and then from that world extracts a self. <clears throat> this is why, regardless of whatever environment you're in, due to the ability of your memory and the fact that you have structures from other moments of your life assisting you in this moment, the mind will always find itself being able to shift identity whether there is external movement or not as if the world has moved enough behind your eyes that uh, even though there is external change it won't change the internal that much <clears throat> what that means is In some sense, when we look at the baby steps of the design of the world, it had to do with objectivity imbuing itself life. Kind of like, again, how a child looks at a toy and makes that toy come alive and it's like its friend or something. We see this in young children. <clears throat> Similarly, man has uh, given himself animated power. That means we are not just objects. If we were just objects, there would be no purpose to life. Life would just be electrons. It's like electrons are hallucinating. Great. Atoms evolve to being thoughts. Great. Now what? <clears throat> I have learned to watch my world through watching myself. And what that means is I find in any human being's life, you're going to be directed in two ways. Either you're ready and you will, in some sense, find your way to the ears of the collective. In other words, you will seek the heartbeat of the civilization. Or in some sense, you will seek your own heartbeat. <clears throat> I have asked my heart why it's beating for so, like so many days. There's been many moments I've asked kind of myself why existence appears in the way it does. And before I can have an opinion, the appearance shifts. <clears throat> you see, it's very easy to study the world uh, or the reality or what appears as real phenomena in front of your eyes. But when it comes to studying stuff behind your eyes, you pretty much are left as a moment of attention. So in front of your, uh, uh, how can I tell you? Um, <clears throat> your objective, your objectivity is basking in your subjectivity. Your subjectivity is basking in your objectivity. The way that you can engage thoughts is you need a basic uh, kind of reference point of a reality. That's the only way you can penetrate kind of the mysteries of the imagination by first having a stable reality. And it's the other way to eventually, if you want to see beyond reality, there has to be data more than the patterns that they normally appear as. <clears throat> You're looking at the weather, uh, at the climate, uh, at the inner climate of the being. That means it could be a sunny day outside, but behind your eyes, it could be a rainy day, you know. So we realize that it's as if the human being has two lives to adjust to. You know, it's not just handling your objectivity and good job. You survived like a fit animal, you know, it's, it's not that. It has to be the evolution of the mind and the mind's greatest product is vision and vision, vision's greatest contribution is action. 
that means we are creatures of sight. We see, we act. We see, we act. We watch, we move. We watch, we move. We observe, we engage. We observe, we engage. You know, eventually it's kind of like we learned it from the sun. The same way light came, kind of imagine the surface of the earth. The earth was around the sun. The sun was hitting the earth and the earth wasn't orbiting and the earth's like, okay, let me get my full body tan, you know, and it started, <laughs> you know, rotating, you know, orbiting. <laughs> I find there is too impeccable of a geometry in this world. For me, uh, the fact that we have a sort of design, uh, that is the most remarkable thing. Existential design in moment, in the presence of momentary experience, that is the... But the fascination of the miracle of life. It is miraculous because it is here. There is something here. You know, right now there could have been nothing. You know, right now it could have been 4 billion years uh, ahead of time and the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way galaxy would have collided in such a way that our planet would not, or would not, would just be a memory for that cosmic sector. <clears throat> it's the evolution of beings. Here's the greatest. It's not a fear, but I find that if we, if if the secrets of nature stretch that far, uh, man's free will is not free. That means, believe it or not, you can get enslaved to objective phenomena, and you can get uh, enslaved to subjective phenomena. As I am speaking right now, there are people in the world. Okay, and these people uh, in the world, some of them are in some sense extremely going into using the rational method, and some of them are using the irrational method, which can be said to be the spontaneous evocational method. <clears throat> it's kind of like, um, to be honest, I have my own opinions on what goes on in you know esoteric communities, but I feel it's a game. It's an unnecessary game because you don't you don't play with the other side of the veil if you understand it. It is not it is not um, something to just be curious about. That means any person doing any spiritual pa practice for self power, you're trying to empower yourself. Let me tell you, you cannot empower yourself that much. <laughs> <coughs> My experiences, uh, there was a time that they didn't define as if my truth was not my experience, it was the voice of the environment. It took me a while to realize what the voice of the environment was and what was my actual experience. And my actual experience was more attributeless than filled with attributes. And it was kind of like uh, what is sees the color that has no color, you know, rather than the color actually being seen. Right now, I see an object. Right now, like I have a laptop in front of me. I see this object, okay? But when I ask myself, where is this object being seen? I find myself in the uh, very profound philosophical position of wondering if the external uh, originates from the inner or the inner originates from the external. And there's a strange codependence that kind of explains all the Zen koans and paradoxes of the world. <clears throat> because believe it or not, if we were meant to be like every other creature, it's as if what made, what made the Homo sapien be so unique? And I find that there can be a bunch of theories. You know, it's that this creature on the surface of this planet had exposure to behavior. You know, we, we have certain people, for example, <clears throat> Terence McKenna, he's a scholar and an ethnobotanist and his kind of view is that it's as if like the mushroom was was a cellular phenomena that came from space debris from another planet maybe and when the human mind engaged with it it tapped into the logos of nature in a way where it was beyond time uh regardless of it was the end or not so it's as if like <laughs> like some people believe that it was the mushroom you know like for example <clears throat> Terence McKenna, in his in his work, he shares that um, he's this guy is pretty much saying the food of the animal evolved the animal. What the creature consumed changed it. Uh, in in some sense, the world changed in accordance to the chemical change of the creature. I find it wasn't just a chemical change. I find it was behavioral. Literally, this ape noticed something that no other animal did. 
our ancestors uh, noticed their difference. You cannot have one part of nature evolving differently than the rest and the rest of nature not realizing it. Man's advancement is, and you see, it's speech. The sophistication of speech. That means one of the first things you require to study in this world is the language of the world. Because young children, they don't, they're not told this, so they don't study the language, so they don't realize the world they see at first is not the world they see. This is, this is a, I find this is the true meaning of wisdom. That means when wise men look at one another, they're not comparing what they know. <laughs> they have a sort of unconscious yana ego about what they don't know, you know? As if one philosopher is saying, don't, don't act, bro. I know way less than you. And then that philosopher is like, no, man, there's no way you know as, as, as little as me. You know, and it's as if it was like the opposite of how we find the ego taking form now. You see, it's, it's a play with absence and fullness. Because if we do, uh, if we choose to engage reality through a secular and uh, through a scientific mindset, uh, there is value in it, but the issue becomes the lifeless component of it. <clears throat> what does that mean? That means science requires free will to do the experiment. That means you have to be part of the phenomena to, for the phenomena to be real for you. If you can't experiment, if you can't be a part of it, if you can't see it in that instant, uh, then it's like, what are we talking about, right? I noticed something very fascinating that I kind of realized why many scientists uh, I, I find harbor a hidden agony. This hidden agony is that science is primarily dependent on mathematical language and its precision. Mathematical language is a way of interpreting the world that doesn't change. That's the beauty of mathematics. It's literally like weapons for the mind. That's what mathematics is. A great mathematician, in some sense, can see um, various dim dim dimensions and their expansion in accordance to basic principles. Basic, base, the basic numerical value given to the phenomena. Okay? However, the language that we speak commonly, this is where the hidden agony comes. It is, it is in the known and unknown. That means it's like, how can we deny imagination its validity when we have a word for it? You know, it was as if the concept was real enough for us to conceptualize. You know, we, we, are, we, are, we are saying that man's mind has exposure to novelty and in having exposure to novelty to, to the new, what appears to it as new, it is in some sense being a new self in the moment, or you can say a new moment of self. Now, where does this take you? You see, language has its limits. That means I can only do so much in these talks. I can say it's like literally there is a language threshold. The experience does not translate beyond how the sensory patterns have given it meaning. I don't know. I don't know why <clears throat> I found within me a sort of care for the material realm. You know, it's, it's kind of like uh, it, when you truly identify as a material being, you don't care for it because you are pretty much slamming subjective meaning into objective fact. And that is kind of tragic. It's as if like the person going home and instead of hugging their, uh, you know, hugging his wife, he's the man is in some sense hugging atoms, you know, if, if, if he dares take it to that level of materialism. Anything you go extremely in, you will, it will change you. That's pretty much the law of life. Anything you put your attention too much on, you will be in that environment long enough to have that environment influence uh, not just your behavior, but how thoughts appear for you. 
<clears throat> it's another way of saying it's like you can find as many roses, but if you're standing in a dumpster smelling them, you know, it's like good luck smelling or just roses, you know. <laughs> People are trying to see uh, truth. And I've noticed something very strange. It was weird for me at first. I'm like, why are all the truths of man out of this world? You know, I looked at traditional spirituality. This is where I find I went against the herd of the traditional spiritual uh, uh, perception. For me, the unknown no longer became just the bridge to a united bliss. I noticed that there is more here. That means it, it's, it's as if it's a spirituality can become a trap when it's escapism of what you must confront. That means on some level, I'm like, okay, if I was to be a truly spiritual being right now, I wouldn't need matter. But why am I in matter? Why is there matter here? Why is there a biological constitution here? So regardless of how much I got fascinated by the mysteries beyond the veil of thought, <clears throat> I realized that the design is meant to have a material journey. So it doesn't matter how much you think you're spiritual, how much you think you're non-spiritual, how much you even have conceptions of the un, uh, like how you've personified the unknown, you know? What language is, is just ways that man's mind engages symbol, brings them to life where others can acknowledge too. To be honest, we are creatures beyond language. I'm, I'm not joking, because let me tell you, there can be states where your thoughts can be totally irrelevant. What that means is just like how, as I'm speaking right now, there's like sentences flowing in my mind as I vocalize them. So similarly, <clears throat> I can have these sentences instantly transform into just a geometrical expression. I, I've, I've just personally in my cellular planes of abstraction, I've taken language and changed it into geometry and I've taken geometry and changed it into language. There is a freedom behind your eyes that in front of your eyes you don't have because behind your eyes, your imagination is like your own private room. You see, you can visualize right now just wherever you are. Imagine like <clears throat> this glowing, hovering orb in front of you in the air, right? Your mind visualizes that it doesn't physically exist Okay, but you see, and in some level it is impossible because the self has changed. Sorry guys, I had this thing on mute and I was just talking. <laughs> the language is a tool. It's a paintbrush. You can use it to give structure to the moment subjectively. Eventually you'll realize the presence of your mind. You can realize your presence of your mind. You can get kind of liberated by it in your dream state or you can have it, have it occur in your waking state. Our waking state has become, our attention has become um, occupied by uh, a sort of entertainment that does not evoke responsibility. 
you can say the human being very fundamentally trying to have uh, movements of coexistence. And it's, it's now a discussion of how much uh, is there a coexistence between observable dimensions of being and, in some sense, unobservable dimensions, the unseen. Ludwig Wittgenstein tells us, this German philosopher, he says, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. So when I say when the world, um, when the when worlds walk for the first time, it is similar. It is literally how kind of Michelangelo says, I saw the angel in the stone and I set it free. So what that means is it's, it's, you see a vision, you see a design and phenomena, and as you engage it, it animates. the first steps of your world into a sort of solid meaning. <clears throat> there's an example, there's this kind of very profound divine metaphor in yogic thought, and it is like there could be different statues, you know, but they could all be made of gold. The whole discussion of the same essence, regardless of the variations of the components of the psyche. That means in Vedic thought, kind of Carl Jung's discussion about the unconscious and conscious is like the, those guys are saying like, don't worry about it. There's something here that's beyond it, right? So metaphysical thought tends to be very powerful and mysterious and exciting because it, it, it lives in the unknown. So you can say metaphysics can only be considered when physics has reached an edge of its capability through um, uh, rational language to provide meaning. That means, in, in one sense, it's one thing to ask for evidence before you believe something, but on another sense, you have to wonder if you can conduct the experiment at all. That means if, we, if scientists were to find an equation, some science theoretical physicists are kind of like... Um, searching for this hidden uh, this hidden haven, you know, of trying to put the whole cosmos into an equation, the whole energetic phenomena of the cosmos into a sort of equation. And the issue is you cannot have a certainty of the value unless you index the whole thing. And it's as if man suddenly, like the first guy who built a ruler, was like, whoa, how long does this ruler have to be to measure the sky? And so you see the sky moves towards the unfathomable. That means our not, we, are, we are moments of attention clothed in knowledge, but our knowledge is clothed in the unknown. So when you really go within, you're wondering about how knowledge is moving in the unknown. So you cannot ignore the unknown. And so you get acquainted, reacquainted with the witness. That's why they call it self-realization. Because it's like there's something here. And then you're realizing it. You're realizing uh, the fabric of the nature of conscious activity in every moment kind of appearing as its own individual being. That means when Heraclitus said no man steps in the same river twice and it's not the same man and it's not the same river, then that brings up the question is if that man had guilt, would he have guilt tomorrow? If he's not the same man, you know, kind of like when you put your foot once in the river, it's a totally different moment in time of, the, of and different elements of water are hitting your foot. But when you put your feet in the river again, it's like the elements have totally changed. So it's not the same river. You know, it's not the same water particles that are hitting your feet. So similarly, we can take this and any, and believe it or not, any concept in a dualistic framework, uh, you can apply fractal theory to it. And what I mean by that is that um, you, you can transform it into a fractal. So you know how Plato says, as above, so below. Um, you look at the macrocosm, you can see it in the microcosm. You look at the microcosm, you see it in the macrocosm. You know, you look at the pyramids of Egypt, you see they're representing the constellation of Orion, for example. Right? 
It's all about how phenomena is being connected to each other. And Mr. Within is saying that the inner dimension of the being is such a presence, non-dual presence, that the, the, this difference between the inner and outer leaves. You can say the mind, the, the, the stomach requires food, and you can say the brain requires uh, what I call receptive expression. That means throughout the day, your intelligence requires to receive from the world a certain amount and also requires to express a certain amount. This is pretty much the workout of the mind. Now, speech and communication is this expressive factor. And if you notice, every time you express something, you, your free will comes, comes into place. That means because your attention has to do an activity, the free will moves it so you instantly are an individual in any time you move. Any time you move. I stand up from this chair regardless of how much I speak about non-dualism, no, I'm an individual in that moment. Okay? But sometimes when, when I say you receive from the world, that's when you receive non-dually. And most people receive dualistically. What that means is they think they're a thought. So any thought they hear, they're relating to that thought. And if, that, if they think they're a thought, it's like so easy manipulation. It's like the dudes literally put a box of a thought in it, on his head, right? And it's like you can take that box and put another box and the person thinks they know. It's like life, life is about the freedom of the experience. It's like, what is this whole, what's the point of freedom of speech if the creature doesn't have an ability to experience freely the world around it? Now, the issue is that because we each have unique DNA, each human being who wants to express their freedom will eventually see it's as if their unique pattern will visit the world of others. You know, the issue with creativity is that it's not that art is dead. It's that the eyes that care about art uh, have become few. I got shocked when I realized certain paintings are being sold for millions of dollars just because of who owned it before. And it was hilarious. It was hilarious for me. It's as if that is, a, that is the greatest insult to art. You see, when, it, when you give a monetary value to the phenomena, you ignore the phenomena. You just see the value. Okay? Life, life has to work with symbols. So it doesn't matter who you are. This is why they said many people back in the day, their profession uh, defined their philosophy on life. Okay? So the guy was a blacksmith and he, they're like, who do you believe in? And the guy's like, you, you really have to ask, you know, I'm using Thor's hammer right now, you know. So the guy would have that Nordic interpretation as if a blacksmith came up with the mythology of it, you know. <clears throat> so what I'm saying is like the action uh, sometimes defines the thought and sometimes thoughts define the action. The child enters in the world as just a pretty much an activity and a phenomena occurring. As this phenomena occurs through its engagement and reception of patterns in its environment, it begins to either express or just purely receive. So you gotta be careful that when you see your child, whoever you are, if you're a parent, you have to make sure this child is receiving from the world properly and also expressing uh, in the world properly. You know, and I'll tell you in Western societies, expression has been so locked down to certain cultural programs of access. And it's because uh, people's attention is on a limiting story. It's like, imagine the whole sum of civilization having a limiting belief. That's kind of like a bad story human beings are telling themselves about their world. That is just by nature of that story making them inefficient. It's as if when you think we're all doomed, you don't really care. <laughs> But if you realize that it's an opportunity of a biological evolution that's taken 4 billion years as if it took, it took 4 billion years for the science project called humanity to appear in the way it is. And it's like it's, it's, like, it's too easy to not care about it. That's why it doesn't feel uh, like the right option. You can live for yourself how many years? Imagine, yeah, you want. And the kid had resources and eventually lived for himself to a point where he's like, what's the point of myself? You see, that's, that's where 
uh, you begin wondering about the unknown. You know, because I'm telling you, before death comes, the unknown has already visited you. What separated, uh, I guess you can even say, it, even during ancient, um, this, this, this may be found to be valid in ancient Egyptian metaphysics, that what was a higher being was not per se a being that, ex that was a higher phenomena. It was just what was more aware. You see, that means the reason that uh, we have Ray Kurzweil and Sam Harris and all these people kind of warning people about AI and being like, hey guys, this, this technology can appear and kind of be the boot that crushes us all, you know? It has to do with our control being in regards to the access of data we have. So we fear that technology because we feel it will be able to process data more than us to a point where we cannot compete. It's a choice, believe it or not. The free will has to be chosen. Your intelligence is not something you have, it's something you choose. Because it has to do with how you navigate the attention. And a Mr. Within is saying to all, all human beings, all self-aware beings, in 2019, you are going to realize the concept of yourself depends on how you have separated yourself from everything. Therefore, you require everything to even have a definition. That means if your world gets hurt, the psychological disposition of who you think you are as a self will hurt. Do you see? So we cannot ignore the world that is being a part of our moment. So how do we attend to it? That is the grand question. And when we look at history, we see really it's not something you can tell people. Life has brought people, opened the eyes of human, various human beings on this planet with different momentum. As if everybody is moving with a certain speed, with a sort of elegance of how they have been designed to receive the world. So there is a, there is a sort of majestic quality because for me... I remember it was when I was younger, it's like I, I, how can I tell you? It's like, how can, it's like every child is fascinated by the king that pulled the sword out of the stone. You know, it is, it is, it is the grand fascination. It is, it is the action that hasn't been done that once it is, is it is extracted, it is landed down. It, it will give great momentum. Because I'm telling you, Western society, its, metaf its philo primal philosophy will be that it will think it's a simulation. So free will would be an unknown simulation, you know? Eastern, Eastern societies, I find they're going to be so stuck on a certain way life is that because they think it has to be that, they can see nothing else. It's as if it's like it doesn't matter if Jesus came back or not because would you recognize him, you know? So in some sense, we, in, in our attempts to sometimes comprehend the world like through the endeavors of psychology, man has made himself more into a machine. Because the more you search something, you want, constantly wonder about what's the smaller particle in that particle, what's the smaller particle in that particle, and you'll eventually see it is going to be meaninglessness. Because you will eventually reverse engineer in any approach, in any endeavor of knowledge to the realization of a spontaneous origin of value. That means regardless of who, how you value yourself now, there was a moment where the value had to originate. So kind of like, it's not just like the, ch the, ba the child is born. It's like after the child is born, then the, the world is born in its subjective being. And it's strange because the real secret is that 
um, what's the, there was an incredible quote about it. It was kind of like, the world is kept by hidden strings that connect us all. The wisdom of duality is its opposite. So pretty much if you think there is night and day, your sense of paradise will be the opposite, you know. Pretty much the way I find most 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 people on this planet are devouring the concept of heaven or consuming that concept, absorbing it, is in a way where they think it's a state where their desires, the consequence of their desires is not their responsibility. This is why they say being too extreme about desires is savage. Like when you see somebody, it's like imagine you're sitting at a somewhere, you know, and suddenly somebody looks at a cake and just starts devouring it, not even using, like cutting the cake, imagine. I've never seen this happen, but I'm, I can visualize it and it's hilarious. And it's like when that happens, you see the person's desire could not keep them alert enough to acknowledge the common structure. Because it doesn't matter where you opened your eyes, you know. Chaos and order are the spices of life. Pretty much your intelligence is experiential and through its experience separates, its separates itself. That means you can look at a tree and just think of a tree and then you can look at a tree and in, in, regard, in some way just look at every, its bark and just consider how it's all like there's a kind of palace of lattice in regards to molecular structure of how that phenomenon is there. Let me tell you why scientists think 99.9% .9 of the atom is empty. It's because that's how far they can see. What I'm saying is when we let our technology define us, that means it's like you, you, you will never see the evidence where in your experimentation you're changing the data. So there's the, you can never experiment to find truth. And when I say this, I'm saying this in regards to uh, the mysteries of consciousness rather than sort of uh, like I, I honor the medical sciences to such a degree that science is, has been the greatest contributor to humanity. But I'm saying the scientific method has its limitations when it wants to see before it actually realizes life is a living phenomena, right? That means it's like, why can't a person talk to a robot? Is because like at some point, it's it, we need the spontaneity, we need the unknown, right? So the, the 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 way language is being used by people is it is it is fueling their it's a, it's 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 the fuel for their uh, inner reality to step out. I don't know why I related it to fuel, but. <laughs>
it's very fascinating it's um we cannot separate the world too much because then we'll have infinity as a problem so in some sense we we are creatures that choose the intensity of how much the rea- what we f- the phenomena we see is interpreted simply or how much from that simplicity arises a sort of complex pattern the mind of man if it surpasses the linguistic dimension is a mystery what do you do with a mystery it's like there isn't much you can do eventually you will have to accept the unknown in the same way as matter because there's this whole fa- fascination most people fantasize other dimensions as being different from here you know but it's like they they're trying to escape this world to go to another world mr within is saying it's it's kind of like an onion style multidimensionality you have to find contentment with what you are and then it doesn't matter where you are you know so the mind is realizing it's 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 nature of being and its nature of being has to do with how much you there is an allegiance of your imagination with reality so you see it's like most people feel uh, imagination is what you can whenever you deviate from reality but we see what is normality is something that's being updated all the time that means what was normal now is not going to be what's going to be normal in a thousand years from now you know what 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 they did thousand years ago wasn't normal and it's like we shouldn't do it here now you know and so so it's as if like how would i say it um our sense of our standard of living has to do with this the wealth of the nation you can say and i find human beings after we get get over this kind of discrimination period that's occurred in human structure it's kind of like believe it or not um human beings the act of communication was very evolutionary important it was very important you know the fact that one one creature wanted to share something with another creature that was a very unique thing that happened in evolution you know because you see in nature it's a lot about a sort of it's as if the world was created through destruction first in greek mythology they say it's as if there was first chronos chaos and so what that means is like it, it's as if so much movement is occurring that cannot be translated until suddenly consciousness pops into motion where it can translate it how it translates it is by creating that means you can not learning is a creative process you know it's as if you have to give something into you have to put something into it you know So some people like holding newborn babies, you know, like imagine uh, you know, your sister's daughter. And you're going to see Mr. Within is saying your mind is holding a newborn world. And it's holding it through language. That means the child is given a gift by the world and the child has to choose how it opens this gift. Pretty much it's your conditioning. that means it's like just like how you are are just being your dna it's like there is so much free will there but uh, similarly a lot of your perspectives on and ideologies on life are also things that it kind of like nature's program has still pushed in you that means we stepped out of the food chain into a sort of civility you know but this civility doesn't mean we have still completely disconnected from the animalistic level of being and this is why human beings and when they become a clear minds where there when there's clarity of mind we realize violence is fool a uh, foolishness right we realize that if the civilization was safe enough for artists to draw their greatest artwork then the world would be an incredible place you see it's as if i i uh, for me um freedom comes with a cost because in order for one moment to be free that means your attention has to be on one reality that's able for me i realize it's as if mastery had internal mastery had to do with just how much you feel the relationship of the knower and the knowledge is i don't know how to say it but like 
you come into peace with the moment. It's as if no person should attempt any complex problem if they can't uh, attend to simple problems. It's, it's, to be honest, just a citizen of this cosmos asking what is the value of, 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 of our attention here. And I think a lot of life is being wasted on individual internal person realities, and we're forgetting that there's this civilization here. You know, and this civilization has among its citizens worlds also, ideologies. You know, I got fascinated when I saw how many people... Um, it's, it's kind of strange. It's as if when you see uh, a, a tribal dynamic of all those people doing the same behavior, for example, after the 6th century, you see it's as if like there is an incredible kind of, um, I guess, psych psychological thing occurring where people started praying in the world. Like you might not believe this, but as I'm speaking in certain countries, it's as if there's so many people just praying. Do you see? And so what that is, is internally they are establishing a relationship with an unknown, but they've only authorized it is because they've accepted that the revelation is a permission slip for them to be able to just accept life. You see, this is why the religious man has a stronger code of ethics uh, than a sort of a person in a hedonistic environment. <clears throat> uh, the reason is, is because that person is limiting their truth. They're like, okay, this is just the only truth. I don't need any more ideology. I don't need to wonder about anything. This, this box of language is going to become my home, this cave of language. And I'm going to go in this cave and I'm going to repeat, repeat, repeat. And hopefully this repetition would have been good. You know? So it's, it's like an endless program. You have literally committed your whole life to a behavioral pattern and if you don't really authentically do the behavioral pattern it's as if you're wasting your time both with the agreement of the uh, non-religious view and the religious view it's as if like both sides are looking at you it's like yo you're faking religion you know like get out of here <laughs> you know so it becomes one of those things where anything you do insincerely you are not caring about that means you won't even apply your mind to this is why if you hate your job, you won't be good at it. I find the world doesn't need truths anymore. It doesn't need answers anymore. There is nothing any person can say anymore that is as valuable as a human being just looking at the sky and being like, okay, my sight is here, what now? You know, and you run into the civilization that uh, you, you had put a blindfold on and you could not see. It's as if, of course, if you put sunglasses at night and look at the stars, the stars are dim always, you know? <laughs> Vision. Believe it or not, my favorite word. Vision. Vision is where meaning is arising from. Vision is the source of language. Vision is how the world is even seen to be articulated. So consciousness is just like a unique presence at most. You know? The Patanjali Yoga Sutras define it so, so magnificently as if it's this glass orb. A perfect metaphor and this glass or whatever surface colored cloth it moves on it takes the color of it guys um, I just paid attention to the comment section and uh, I'm impressed uh, I'm gonna say I agree but I don't believe rationalization has destroyed all wonder because rationalization is a lens, you know, it's, it's more what has destroyed wonder is what is directing attention. So I realize what is more valuable than money, you know, to be honest, in, in modern society, money is like, wow, you know, it's like, 
you know, <laughs> let's collect green pieces of paper, you know, like that's the mentality. People are running, running after uh, abstraction, you know, <clears throat> and um, but what is beyond money is attention, attention, you know. And it's about how from the moment you wake up, this attention moves in this life till the moment you sleep. That's, that's, that's the value, right? Because for me, I, I personally have this view that language I'm playful with. Language is like, sure, you can take a sentence and think that's the, all everything. It's like you can look at any object and think that's the truth. That's what the concept of idol worship was. You know, so what's happening with subjective truth that it's becoming language worship. So after we started uh, worshiping objects, we started worshiping language. Now, for a long time, you know, <clears throat> for a long time, we're still like, it's when I walk in the city, trust me, it's language worship. Let me tell you why. Because you can find the most up-to-date language and say it and see everybody's eyes shine. <laughs> it's, it's, there's a sort of roboticness because the inner realities are so kept hidden. On some angle that is required, we can't be ourselves because it's like, uh, if we were ourselves, how can I say it? You, every room you enter, it's as if that's a different you. You know, My grandfather who passed away when I was 10, he said... He had, it's not something that I heard from him, but I asked one of my cousins later on, and he said that one thing my grandfather would say is that when you come home after work, he was an incredibly like industrial person, you know, he would uh, uh, go to his factory and just come, he owned the factory, and he would go and uh, uh, he would come home, and every time he would come home, he would take off his hat, he would step out of that room. Do you know, literally when he entered his house, he was a father. He, was a, he wasn't a businessman. When he stepped out of the house, it's as if his suit and tight were so, so kind of like strict, I guess, like <laughs> that he was a businessman. You see, so we entertain archetypes kind of like it's like this is how the yogi said life is a play. It's a, the it's a theatrical performance, you know. So what it means is it's like you're, you're, you're moving through different, uh, you're, the spotlight of your attention is moving on different things, you know. Um, I'm reading the chat section now. Just a second. Yeah, 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 I agree uh, with, with what Sagan Williams says, different mindsets for different environments. Um, yeah, because the environment is not in our control. Can I choose the weather right now? You know, it's like I can't, right? So the environment defines, to be honest, where our mind is set to ask the question, right? So we cannot Im avoid the environment's influence. But this is where the whole argument of free will comes. For example, when I listen to Noam Chomsky, um, and f when he speaks about language, for him, he has concluded a sort of that language occurs prior to consciousness, you know? So it's as if, again, just the biological activity uh, is surpasses the conceptual framework. Again, it's a hallucination of matter, you know? So either, either mind, either the world is, uh, either objectivity is being considered first or subjectivity. Trust me, any person who says spirituality, the word, you know, it's like they're considering subjectivity first and then objective. So their inner truth is more valid than what's actually out there, which could be meaningless. Right? And it could be the total opposite too, you know? There's so many different human beings, it's as if eventually every corner of the earth will be seen, you know? <laughs> And uh, I don't know to, to some degree how much a person can escape the influence of their ecosystem and their environment, right? Like you get defined again like that glass orb. The best thing I find is you acknowledge that it's like the glass orb. So um, I, this is kind of strange, but there's been moments where I've gotten angry and literally I've playfully just as if, as if a, a mosquito was around me, I've sl like tried to like slap the thought away, you know? <laughs> as if in, in some sense, I, I exerted free will in my inner reality as acknowledgement of phenomena, honestly, something like that. 
you know. So it's kind of like we are in a society where we are being rewarded by being similar to others. That's a huge problem. Because what if every person is seeing something unique that requires to be communicated, you know? So the whole concept of self, self-worth is messed up because self has only been ascribed to objectivity and objectivity, it's it, the only thing, truth about it is it, it, it changes, you know? <laughs> That's it. Energy doesn't get destroyed. It just changes from form to form, you know? Certain moments where you act in life, it's kind of like kinetic energy, you know? So certain moments where you're just sitting on a rock contemplating your potential. <laughs> so um, various states, you know? And it's as if every person's mind is a different instrument. So for me, I'm like, the school system is trying to, like, think about it. Something I can say is that um, it's the relationship of the being with language that kind of creates the container where emotions come and give the uh, character and the story meaning. So what it is, is I kind of looked at it and I'm like, I have to choose if I am my thought or not. If I am my thought, you have to be responsible for what that thought leads you to. And I guess in another way of looking at it, you know, because I find everything, you can look at it from different degrees. There's never only one way to say something, you know. (laughs) But um, from a different angle, we kind of see that it's... um, Like, how can I say it? Nature is like a machine. It's this machine. You can't ignore it. It's this elemental thing. The laws of the cosmos are kind of like you can you can playfully make it the divine will of God or whatever, you know. So your mind can just like how the child looks at a teddy bear and makes it its best friend. You can look at the sky and make it into like as infinite and multidimensional as you want. Right. So it has to be a sort of authenticity with what is naturally arising in your intelligence. Right. Because if you are not when I say natural, it's kind of strange to speak about it. Right. Because it's kind of like it's something that's here before we have an opinion on it. That's what nature is. And uh, the human being has an ability to listen to the whole moment or to a certain component. Your attention can zoom in on a certain factor in your moment, right? Any moment where I have to do quickly, quick movements, I, I've, I've kind of become acquainted to being the whole moment. So literally I'm, I'm a mind where the body is moving in the field of my knowing. And there's been times where it's as if I've allowed the body to move and then the knowing can acquaint and adjust. Right. So the, 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 the thing that our minds are giving us is um, extra vision in compared to other species, you know, and this extra vision. I'm like, what is the purpose of it? Is it only everybody going and living for themselves? And I'm realizing it can't be. That's that's like, you know, it makes no sense why the design was there. It's like a bunch of puzzle pieces thrown on the table, you know, and you're like, no, this can't be all one puzzle piece. Each piece is its own world and artwork and every piece should just live for itself, you know. So this, the, the story, Jordan Peterson is an incredible speaker on this. I don't think he relates it to a kind of global endeavor. Uh, in the context I am, but he he says it in, um, how would I say it? (sighs) Sometimes I think too fast, guys, you know, it's a thought moves to be too quick. The narrative, another way of saying this is the ethos of a community, the ethos. And what that is, is pretty much the overall inspiration of all those people in the same moment, you know, in the same space. So the narrative, the kind of story we're saying, you know. (sighs) 
you know, um, uh, Sagan Williams, you know, I'm going to tell you, I just read your comment and let me tell you this. Um, it's very hard to blame the world without realizing you're blaming how you're, you've opened your eyes to it. So I, I personally realized like I, I, I kind of don't touch beliefs. That means it's, I, I find it's like, it doesn't mean you shouldn't have any beliefs. It, it, it just means that um, maintain your distance with how language is filtering the world for you, right? So eventually you'll reach a point where you'll be indifferent. You'll be indifferent to objective phenomena, subjective phenomena, not because it's like there's nothing and oh my God, you've attained meditative samadhi or something. No, no, it's not because of that. It's just because you're observing, right? It's like look in the mirror. Who do you think is looking through your eyes? It's some sort of intelligent pattern, intelligent design, right? It's some sort of intelligence moving design, right? And we can think about it in different ways. We can think the intelligence arose from the particle as if it's just a biological elemental thing again, right? As if like the atom was a seed for all how all of manifestation appeared. Kind of like how the atmosphere is all atoms. But I'm, but I'm saying like, I'm just saying this through Sagan Williams. I'm just saying what I'm telling you. I'm just saying it through my own experience of kind of thinking that every day I woke up in this life, a wave of data hit me. Like waves of data endlessly hit me. And in regards to my actions, I was choosing which, which ways my, the mind's antenna was being kept in the day. So I'm saying eventually I, I realize I had to, you, you'll, you'll realize the great, greatest teaching of the known is, is kind of those fingers that point to the unknown. So the unknown becomes more fascinating. How, how, how you look at what you know and you, you begin internally advancing the conceptual framework. Because most people are waiting for God to come and, you know, move the blindfold from their eyes, not realizing they are choosing, you know. There's, a, there's this incredible Rumi quote. Let me find this. Um, Yo, Sagan Williams, thanks. Thanks for your comment, man. I'm going to share this quote. Guys, check this out. This quote is very fascinating. This quote is a reflection of all civilizations in every moment of time. And yet any time a creature allows chaos to define its order, <clears throat> pretty much you allow the external to define your inner reality. Because the moment you allow too much the external, the moment you become too much of a follower, you will feel your free will is, an, is, is external too. You know, you have to, it's like creativity is a way of keeping your mind alive in a world that wants to keep it the same every day. You know, so Rumi says you were born with wings. Why prefer to crawl through life? So that's the cool thing as if we harbor this innate ability which we don't have access to because the, the, the theater play of the civilization is not giving it access, right? So it, this, is, this is a domain of really big theories. So, so what that means is I, I see theories like as giant rocks, okay? So a really giant theory, one mind can't just, just move that boulder, you know? So eventually I find that... Um, Pretty much, it's like realizing freedom of speech means you have to have that freedom internally. Something like that, you know. <laughs> I'm 
I'm going to tell you this um, really cool story, you know. Anybody who tends to hear this story becomes really quickly a, 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 a true fan of Tibetan Buddhism. <laughs> and it's the story of Guru Padmasambhava. A historic figure in which his the stories of him kind of revealed a um, very beautiful girl crying. <laughs> Don't worry about it, man. It's okay. What happens is he sees he sees this really incredible uh, this um, really like beautiful girl crying, right? And he has the Guru Pamasamava goes up to her and has this enlightening conversation with her, and she suddenly gets fascinated because it's as if the world Guru Pamasamava is standing in is different than how she is seeing her sorrow. So imagine you kind of crying over a sort of suffering and then suddenly having a conversation with someone realizing in their reality that suffering never existed, you know? So now what happens in the story is there's a spy and this, this beautiful girl ends up being the princess of the kingdom and the spy sees this, goes and tells the king, you know? <laughs> and what happens is the king says, bring them to me in front of the town. I'm going to make a statement. And as the storyteller, I'll tell you, it's a statement of wrath. This king wants to kind of give a message. It's kind of like a political move. <laughs> they bring Guru Pamasambhava and the princess. And the princess just runs to the father and starts shouting. Just shouting crazy, like as if trying to bring the father outside of his ego. You know, back to himself. Right? And the father doesn't hear the cries of this princess to stop. And Guru Pamasambhava suddenly sees that they're bringing firewood in. And it's as if they want to burn him alive in front of the town. And all the town people have, have come here. Just imagine. You know? <laughs> you're walking by a river peacefully one moment. The other moment you're about to be burned in front of a town of, of people who, are, who you don't even know that town. You know? <laughs> so what happens is the king avoids all voices and shouts to all the people. And he says, any person, any man who comes near my daughter, this is your destiny. This is what will happen to you. And Guru Padmasambhava... Guru Pamasambhava, he smiles. He smiles at the princess and he's like as if like another day's work. <laughs> he doesn't say that. Like he, he smiles as if he's content, as if he's seen the moment move before he needs to do anything. And so what happens is he goes and he just by his own choice before the king shouts at him kind of rudely and tells him to go in the middle of the, uh, you know, to be burnt. He just goes in the middle and sits in a meditation kind of lotus position. And they start setting this fire with a flame and kind of like a Colosseum crowd psychology is going on. And people are like, yeah, burn this random guy. Nobody knows what he did, you know. Like, <laughs> That was the, that was the mob psychology. You know, mob psychology is so dangerous because it makes the the members feel alive by participating in something bigger than themselves, right? But anyways, what happens is that everybody's shouting, "Yeah, burn him, burn him, burn him!" And the princess kind of like just is shocked as to what happened right now, and the king is kind of laughing and he's like, "Yeah, you know." <clears throat> what happens is. Just a second, guys. Are all settled and all the wood has turned into ash, but it's as if the fire never touched Guru Padmasambhava. There are certain stories in ancient mythologies, you know, even in the Islamic tradition, even in the Buddhist tradition, Christian tradition, where inanimate objects, uh, due to their compassion for the being, moved away from the being. Like, for example, in, in the Islamic tradition, there's a saying, it's as if there was a poisoned food and the Prophet was such a compassionate person that it's as if the food... Of course, this is ideology. Uh, this is something like it's like nobody was alive in the 6th century to confirm. But like, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> the, the ideology moves in such a way where it was as if the inanimate was such so in love with the peace of that being that the inanimate moved away. 
as if the world had a mind that acknowledged the efforts of the being. So anyways, the thing happens, Guru Padma Sambhava is untouched and the whole crowd is like, oh my God, you know, this man is like, you know, you know, there's nothing cooler than this, you know. <laughs> and what happens is, uh, believe it or not, in this actual story, um, um, this is recorded kind of strangely, um, what happens is the king in instantly is so fascinated that he gives, he gives, um, what is it? It's like the, um, the princess marries Guru Parmesambhava. And it was as if Guru Parmesambhava was not conceptually looking at life. You know, he was, he was, um, he was, he was, how can I tell you? I mean, of course I should, I shouldn't make it too descriptive, but I'm saying it's as if he knew the nature of the outcome of all phenomena, regardless of what happened, as an internal, like as an internal, and like, I don't know how to say it, it's like the moment is present in ways where language is light years behind. So I'm just simply noticing, I mean, I got to relate it, you know, all these, um, these viewpoints are all building to this point that it's not just people we should pay attention to, it's the worlds those people are in. You know, think as if you in the future had a grandson and you wondered about, you know, your grandson and you, you do not just wonder about who that person was, you'd also wonder about what world are they in. Is the world too intense in the mind of the child or is the world kind of maintainable? You know, because if the child gets conditioned into a lack of freedom, and unfortunately many children in kind of poverty-stricken countries, oh, their psychologies must be savage. It's as if it's the failure of humanity to make the world such a peaceful journey that human, every human being can experience a decent mind. It's as if it's like the world is too stuck on objectivity to even care for people's minds. The educational system is designed in a way The educational system was designed in a way that it's like 8 billion different DNAs, all different viewpoints of intelligence have to adjust to one system, one educational system. It's like, give me a break. It should be with technology should advance to a degree where the educational system realizes every person's new viewpoint upon the same idea or whatever idea, you know, or whatever glory the educational system holds on to, you know. We are noticing an evolutionary leap of the psychology of the individual into realizing it is not just the mind is not just creating it, this idea of the self, but it's also creating the impressions upon the world. Presence is how the cosmos is existent and your personality is the kind of certain, uh, certain range of uh, experience of this so um all right so let's let's see the chat box man <laughs> i'm not sure what record you're referring to and that's a perfect metaphor yeah schools are built like factories kind of sad they're built like factories where economical value is superior so economy the economy or knowledge it's like children are not being taught knowledge for the sake of knowledge they're being taught it for the sake of economical kind of positioning it's um here let me see if i can find a link for you guru rinpoche princess story <laughs> Honestly, I, I don't know if it's, um, there's a video I'm going to share and I don't know, maybe it's not here.
Oh, here. Here. I think this is... Uh, I mean, I, I can't find it exactly, but, <laughs> but uh, here's a Wikipedia link. I think it's in here. When I searched it, this came up. <laughs> Just in like 2013, I went into a f incredibly Buddhist phase. <laughs> Like to a point where I was, I was conscious of emptiness in every moment to a point where it was, there was no emotional ar ar arising, you know, but, uh, eventually you'll see, you have to abide by your nature. That's where your strength is. And language is literally like caveman created fire. We spark language. So we, we put symbolism on phenomena. So that means we have the freedom to see it differently. So it's not just, it doesn't matter what kind of proof they give you, you can see that proof in many ways internally, you know? Rabindranath Tagore says, you cannot cross the sea by merely staring at it. And I find our, our civilization literally, if it, it cannot just to stare at the mind and to want to like cross the sea you know you have we have to have efforts initiatives and that's kind of like we pretty much need school the school of athens popping up everywhere in the world you know where the minds of human beings do dialogue expands you know Okay, <laughs> thanks Sagan Williams. Thanks for participating, man. These live stream, these live streams are kind of like for this stuff. So uh, thanks for tuning in. There was a time where uh, I asked myself if I had a time machine and I could go back in, in, in the past and tell myself one thing, what would it be? Like as if, if I had only one chance to say like a few words. And I would say that I would go back to my past self and say existential allowance, meditate on existential allowance until you realize why the free will is here. The issue is that I find there's a short time span, maybe like, I'll say 100 to 200 years at most, where in this time span, the psychology of the children of the next future generations is going to be convinced that a technolo technological reality is superior than a natural one. Literally, it, we, it will be the biological extinction, but not... But what it means is in this gap, there is an opportunity for any human being that is alive to kind of somehow look at nature in a way where they've never seen it before. Kind of realize there is a value to the air we breathe, you know. And uh, time conquers us all. Time is a conqueror. And sometimes you got to stare that conqueror in the face and kind of, you know, just play your part. There's a quote by Rabindranath Tagore. I'm going to look it up. He says... I'm just going to go into a quote tunnel. I do these in these talks where I kind of 
focus on one person and notable person in history and I just read a bunch of their quotes so people get a sense of how that person's mind was open to the world. So Rabindranath Tagore, this Indian polymath, like Einstein, went to visit him. Einstein went to visit him. Like, that's the level this guy was. <laughs> you know, Tagore says, facts are many, but the truth is one. He says, the water in a vessel is sparkling. The water in the sea is dark. The small truth has words which are clear. The great truth has great silence. This is one of his most famous quotes. He says, beauty is truth's smile when she beholds her own face in a perfect mirror. And to be honest, it took me a while to get this. I think it like this, this quote was lurking in my subconscious and I was kind of taking like glimpses at it for a long time, you know? What it means is when there is contentment of self and contentment with world. And that, that, is, that is where beauty becomes authorized as an existential allowance. Beauty is more freedom than a sort of image, or a sort of uh, kind of, uh, you know, Western Enlightenment uh, romanticism. You know, there's nothing wrong with romanticism, but in, in, in some levels of philosophy, it's as if the philosophers are like soldiers on a battlefield who don't want the lovers of the world to get disturbed, you know. Anyways, guys, I hope this talk was helpful. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Much blessings and namaste.